On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, tonight I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's event with Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein discussing her latest work, Plato at the Googleplex Why Philosophy Won't Go Away. Plato. <laughs> Plato. I. It's usually the case that when a writer devotes a book to a particular thinker, the writer thinks that this particular thinker had all the answers. I don't think that about Plato. I don't think that a man who lived 2,400 years ago and who railed against that newfangled technology, writing, writing things down, has all the answers for us. But he is an extraordinary figure. Uh, he pretty much uh, discovered the essential nature of the philosophical question. Uh, he inherited this peculiar kind of question from Socrates and the pre-Socratics, uh, but he saw its essential nature and he applied it to just about every area of human inquiry and human concern, to mathematics, to history, to religion, to art, to language, uh, politics, uh, education, child rearing, um, wherever there was a philosophical question to be asked, he sniffed it out. It's almost as if he raised the entire sunken continent of Atlantis, uh, which is a very apt metaphor because our first allusion to the myth of Atlantis comes from Plato, right, in the Timaeus uh, and the Cratylus. So I, I, he's always he's always interested me. Um, in fact, I have a very long relationship with him because when I was a child, and uh, any of you have read any of my former novels, or for that matter, Betraying Spinoza, uh, know that I came from a very orthodox Jewish household, and we were not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath, uh, which in the summer was extremely long, but read. Um, and one day I picked up this book. Uh, I was 12 years old and it was called The Story of Philosophy by Will Durant. And I don't know what it was doing in my house. <laughs> it was not the kind of books we usually had lying around. Uh, maybe my mother got it from the Book of the Month Club. And I opened it up and the first chapter was Plato. And I started to read this thing, and I certainly didn't understand very much. I remember there was the word phantasmagoria, and you know, I went to look it up in my little pocket dictionary, and it wasn't even there. And I thought, this is this is really intelligent stuff. It's not even in the dictionary. But I didn't understand very much. But it just blew me away. I I was a first, I was so excited that at a certain point I had to put the book down, you know, because my heart was just racing so much. It was this vision of beauty, truth, and goodness all intertwined and intelligible, existing eternally beyond chaos and confusion. And all I pretty much knew was chaos and confusion. <laughs> that was pretty much my life. And uh, this vision uh, was just um, inspiring, as, as it has been to so many. Um, I didn't decide to go on to philosophy then. I liked science much more. But um, but it was there, uh, this, this notion. And Plato also, uh, you know, he's very important in philosophy of mathematics. It's kind of the only place where contemporary philosophers still talk about Platonism. Uh, he's intri he was intriguing to me, and I wanted to get closer to him, to understand him, and the only way I know how to get closer is to recreate, to make, a, make up a character, sort of the way Plato did with Socrates, right? Plato did the same thing for Socrates. Uh, his dialogues, we have all of his dialogues, and 25, we know that because no dialogue is ever mentioned that we're missing, unlike the works of Aristotle. Uh, but 25 of the 26 uh, dialogues feature Socrates. Um, and these were all written after Socrates had died. One of the things I think I've come to know about 
Plato, we know so very little about him personally, said he loved Socrates. He, he, he truly loved Socrates and this cre recreation of that beloved voice in the dialogues. Um, it was, I think, a way of bringing Socrates along with him as Plato developed into the extraordinary philosophical genius that he was, taking philosophy much further, I would argue, uh, than Socrates had. I wanted to do something like that uh, for Plato. So the book is two parts. It's ten chapters. Five of them are expository. They go back uh, into ancient Greece um, and try to understand the great mystery, not just of how Plato came to be, um, but how the Greeks came to be. Uh, I mean, they're they're just amazing, right? It was, uh, they went in 200 years from illiteracy and anime to Aeschylus and Aristotle, right? These were really high achievers and really on the fast track and it's an extraordinary thing. They did everything. They didn't just do philosophy, discover philosophy, but in some sense discovered science, ma abstract mathematics, the study of history as opposed to just writing uh, chronicles, um, democracy, uh, timeless art, poetry, uh, architecture. This is extraordinary people. What was it about them? And um, what was it about them that prompted them, primed them to ask this peculiar kind of question, the philosophical question. So that's part of what I'm doing also, trying to solve the mystery of why the Athenians executed Socrates. So there's all this going back into the past uh, to try to understand uh, the nature of why philosophy emerged at the time that it did and in the place that it did. But then I suppose the shtick I do, um, and it is part of trying to make the argument that the questions that, philo that uh, Plato first formulated continued in our own day, and they are, we have never been more preoccupied with these questions, um, is that I created these Platonic dialogues, Plato in our day. And the first place I do take them to is the Googleplex. It is the headquarters of Google um, in Mountain View, uh, California. I was there last book, uh, giving an Authors at Google talk, and I'm going back next week to give an Authors at Google talk at Googleplex. We'll see how that goes. And uh, um, I bring Plato there, and he falls into a dialogue with his media escort, a very practical woman who certainly seems never to have thought about philosophy, but actually has a lot to teach Plato. Um, and uh, a software engineer who tries to convince Plato that the ethical questions that he raised can now be crowdsourced and in fact we could develop a search engine uh, that would work on some sort of you know algorithm and, and the way the Google search engine does and deliver us our ethical answers and we don't need any ethical experts, we don't need philosophers, we have crowdsourcing. And you can imagine how Plato reacts to that argument. Um, but the important thing that happens uh, at the Googleplex is that Plato gets a Chromebook. Right? He gets himself a, a, a computer and he's very becomes very addicted to the internet. He's very interested in it. He's taking MOOCs. Um, and this is really important because I bring him up to speed very quickly. Uh, so as Plato, with his intellect, with his, right, but he understands, uh, or he's learning. Uh, he's on a steep learning curve, uh, Plato. Um, I bring him to several other places. Um, I'm going to read to you a little bit from various of, of the dialogues, just a very little bit, just to give you an idea. He goes, as many authors do, I don't think I would um, go even if invited. He goes on cable news um, on on a show I call The Real McCoy and it's uh, Roy McCoy is the interviewer and um, I'm just going to read from the beginning just to give you a, a sense of it. Oh and I should say that um, 
If you buy the book, you will see parentheses all over the place because I, um, I take passages from Plato, from the 26 dialogues, and I fit them in to our dialogues. As I think quite seamlessly. I think they sound very natural um, and that, you know, when I'm just reading them and I'm not going to tell you, uh, you know, what I lifted and what I made up, um, but, um, you know, I think maybe you can't tell. Uh, anyway, uh, that happens in everything that I'm going to read you. There's going to be stuff taken out of the real Plato. Okay, Roy McCoy. Okay. So they tell me you're a big deal in philosophy, Plato. I'm going to tell you up front, because that's the kind of guy I am, up front, that I don't think much of philosophers. Plato, many don't. The term attracts a wide range of reaction from admiration to amusement to animadversion. Some people think philosophers are worthless and other that they are worth everything in the world. Sometimes they take on the appearance of statesmen and sometimes of sophists. Sometimes, too, they might give the impression that they're completely insane. I just have to tell you, that's from the sophist. Uh, McCoy. Well, I'm going to go with that last one. <laughs> just as long as you add that it's the kind of insane that makes right-thinking Americans the world over want to smack you upside the head. Plato, it comes sometimes to reactions even more violent. My friend, the best of men, was charged with the crime of doing nothing more than practicing philosophy as best as he knew how. He was found guilty and executed. McCoy, where was that? Texas? <laughs> Plato, no, it was in Greece, though many years ago. McCoy, I'm sorry to hear about your friend's ordeal, but I have to ask you a question. What was he doing to tick people off so much? Plato, it is a good question. McCoy, since you apparently don't know me, you don't know that I only ask the one kind of question, and that kind is good. So unless your friend was prosecuted under the, that military junta you Greeks had going on back there in the late 60s, early 70s, Plato, he was brought to trial by our democracy, and in fact, it was by popular vote that he was condemned to die, even though the Delphic Oracle had declared that there was no person who was wiser than he. McCoy, yeah, well, I have two Peabody's. Listen, not to disrespect the me memory of your friend, but there's got to be more to the story than what you're saying. You're spinning, and I'm calling you on it. We don't call this the no bull bin for nothing. See, democracies don't go around bumping people off just for being annoying types who think they know better than anybody else, which, from what I can gather, is what you philosophers specialize in. In fact, I have to say, Plato, I haven't spoken to you two minutes and you're already beginning to irk me. But we live in a democracy that protects everyone's right to be a royal pain. Plato, progress has been made. McCoy, debatable. Plato, I am impressed by the progress. McCoy, then maybe your initial expectations were too low. Plato, maybe they were. McCoy, you sure you're a philosopher? You seem a little too ready to change your mind. Or maybe you just don't have the courage of your convictions. Plato, I would prefer the courage of my questions. It goes on. <laughs> it goes on. Um, uh, one of the things that when, when Plato first discovers our technology and becomes so intrigued by the internet, um, he's very excited at all of the information that we now have available to us. He hopes even knowledge that we now, maybe wisdom that we now have available to us. And um, he becomes disillusioned and it really climaxes on this show uh, with the way that we're using technology for instead of our um, engaging in dialogues and testing our assumptions against people who don't share our assumptions. In fact, um, on our blogs and 
from whatever it is where we are on the internet, we're mainly talking to people who share our assumptions, who share our viewpoint, and even worse, uh, we're getting our news from sources that already agree with us. Uh, as you all know, Plato was very concerned about uh, the democracy of Athens. He was not a fan of the democracy of Athens. And he becomes increasingly concerned about our democracy because of uh, the kind of what he had thought was an opening up of dialogue he comes to see as a closing off. Um, strangely, I, um, I share that concern that Plato comes to have. I'm going to read to you um, a little bit from um, one of the other things he does is um, he gives love and sex advice. Again, Plato was very, very concerned with romantic love. He, gave, he wrote two extraordinary dialogues, the Symposium um, and the Phaedrus, about romantic love. And uh, in the Symposium, he has uh, Socrates give a long speech uh, from which we derive our somewhat degraded notion of Platonic love. Uh, but it is a notion of sort of sublimating the erotic longing that we direct at the beautiful young things um, and uh, taking that erotic longing, uh, our love for beauty, um, and directing it to more worthy objects than beautiful young things, uh, to love of you know mathematics and uh, just laws and truth and beauty and goodness. Um, and um, yeah, right. <laughs> And then he has uh, at the, uh, that's not the climax of the, uh, the symposium, Alcibiades, the deliciously naughty boy of ancient Athens, comes crashing in at the end and all chaos uh, breaks out. And in the, di the uh, expository chapter before this chapter, which is called XXX Plato, um, I, I talk a lot about Alcibiades, dangerous Alcibiades, and the love between Socrates and Alcibiades. Socrates loved Alcibiades. Uh, and Alcibiades, all of Athens loved Alcibiades, and he betrayed them uh, time and time again. He betrayed Athens to Sparta, their mortal enemies during the Peloponnesian War. He then betrayed uh, uh, Sparta and all Greeks uh, to the Persians. Uh, then the Athenians took him back again. He was irresistible, uh, Alcibiades, and um, he uh, just wreaked uh, uh, havoc. And so having him crash in after Socrates has given this uh, inspiring speech about how we have to sublimate our erotic longing sent a message. But in the Phaedrus, Plato reverses himself. Now he, um, he gives, has Socrates give one speech and then another speech um, in favor. The first speech is against the madness of love and the second speech is this passionate, uh, lyrical speech. It actually lapses into rapturous poetry, um, beautiful in the English and even more beautiful in the ancient Greek, um, lapses into this poetry singing the praises of the madness of love. And it makes many people think, and I'm one of them, that Plato was in love when he, when he wrote that uh, dialogue. And that's so wonderful that he changes his philosophical view uh, because he's in love. That's wonderful. Anyway, so in this next chapter, I have Plato giving sex and love advice. And I don't know if any of you know um, the advice columnist. She lives right here in uh, Cambridge, Margot Howard. She used to write under Dear Prudence, and then she wrote under Dear Margot. She's um, from a famous family of advice columnists. Her mother was Ann Landers. Her aunt was um, uh, Dear Abby. And uh, what I did was I made up questions uh, that I knew from the symposium and of the Phaedrus, but from other places as well, from the Republic as well, other places, uh, Plato would have something to say. So I made up these questions, and then I sent them to Margot. And Margot, like her mother, Ann Landers, often has consultants. I'm actually her philosophical consultant. Margot's whenever she has a philosophical, she thinks it's a philosophical question, she sends it to me. Um, so, but here, Margot consults Plato. And it was really interesting because uh, Plato actually, based on the symposium and the Phaedrus and other things, he was often 
more liberal than Margot. And um, I'll give you an example. Here's, I think I have about 11 questions. I had to stop. I just kept thinking of more and more questions. But um, here's the first one. Dear Margot, I'm a female graduate student, and though I'm sexually adventurous, I'm no slut. One of my professors has proposed that he be my professor with benefits, if you get my drift. We've both got partners, but our relationships are open, so there's no question of cheating. There's also no possibility that we'd get emotionally involved since our affections are otherwise engaged. Frankly, I see this as a good educational move on my part. The man is one of the best minds in my field, and I'd learn a lot from the extra face time with him. Conversations with him are always stimulating. He's also, all, also got powerful connections and promises he'd help me professionally. The job market in my field has tanked, and though I'm at a top-notch department, we grad students need all the help we can get. I trust my professor to keep his word since all indications are that he's a man of honor. And he's been completely upfront with me. Do you think I should take him up on this offer that we mutually enjoy and use each other? Yours truly, pursuing higher dreams. Dear PhD. <laughs> and this is really straight now what Margot answered me. Uh, wow, the casting couch has moved to academia. What theatrical people call a good career move, you're calling a good educational move. I can tell you that your crystal ball can't be entirely trusted when it forecasts that neither of you will become emotionally involved. One never knows how these things will play out. But hey, if you fell for each other and ditched your partners, think of the professional possibilities. You do seem clear-eyed, however, about mutually using each other, you and this man of honor. What you are suggesting is commerce, my dear. There is a name for people who trade sex for money or entree. If you are comfortable with that, fine with me. But this being a full service advice column, I decided to consult one of the world's leading experts in moral philosophy. Plato is probably the most quoted thinker in the world and now I'm joining the crowd. Here's what the philosopher has to say. I commend PhD for the high value she places on wisdom and knowledge. For wisdom's sake, there is no disgrace in being servant and slave to a lover. No reproach for a person willing to give honorable service and the passion to become wise. It's from the youth through the myths. What PhD must ask herself is whether the arrangement that she is contemplating with such cool and disinterested calculation is truly one that will end in her having acquired the knowledge for which she longs. There would be no passion in this relationship. Those are the terms on which this affair would be conducted. Nothing transformative would occur with each re remaining firmly in possession of itself. Again, those are the terms on which this affair would be conducted. But PhD should consider whether these very terms preclude the possibility of attaining the good she desires. Wisdom is an extraordinary state. It requires experience sufficiently out of the ordinary to break the hold over us of our habitual ways of seeing and being, which are in truth ways of not fully seeing and not fully being. There are those who have been granted genius, artistic, intellectual, spiritual, and the extraordinary makes itself available to them in the sphere of their genius. But for those unvisited by genius's spirit, there is only eros to break the heavy sleep of ordinary life and lead the way to the extraordinary. Eros wrenches the soul from its lazy reliance on conventions that substitute for sight. Gripped by the intensity of erotic longing, a person begins to know the world and its beauty. She knows the world is beautiful because it contains the one she loves. Neither human judiciousness nor divine madness can provide a human being with any greater good than that. There is risk in approaching Eros on these terms, but that is because any transformative experience carries risk. But so too is their risk in forcing Eros to surrender to our ordinary calculations. It is the risk of never surrendering oneself to Eros. These are the risks that PhD, yearning for knowledge, should consider. 
So there you have it, PhD, continues Margot. I guess I'm a bit more old school than Plato when it comes to the kind of arrangement you're talking about here. But even he thinks that you've got more to lose than gain by your higher education shenanigans. And since you seem to be and it, since you seem like the kind of kid who tallies up her wins and losses pretty crassly, whoops, I mean closely, you'd probably best pay attention, Margot, philosophically. So, and uh, those of you who remember your Phaedrus know exactly the situation that I was using there. Um, the last thing I, I'm, I'm going to read to you is um, Plato, uh, Plato gets a brain scan. Um, he uh, he gets he's very into uh, um, catching up on science. He takes a MOOC on uh, neuroscience, um, and he uh, volunteers for an experiment. Actually, that here <laughs> I call it Olympia University. I don't call it Harvard University, um, and um, I volunteered as part of the con uh, control group for this same um, for this same test um, and, and went into the magnet. Um, it was in fact, uh, for those of you who, who know this neuroscientist, it was uh, Jack Buchholz and he was, he was terrific. And, um, but the guy, the neuroscientist here is, um, is not, <laughs> he's not. He's a very arrogant man um, who is very, very surprised to find out that there are even philosophers employed by his university. And he says, you know, do they share a department with the alchemists and the uh, astrologers? You know, it's just, uh, um, I'm just going to break in to the middle. Um, his name is Shoket. Um, a little private joke because in Hebrew that means slaughterer. <laughs> um, Shoket, I think that sort of nitpicking is missing the larger point, which is this. There are no inten intentions and no decisions because there's nothing like them at the level of what's really going on. When you get right down to it, there isn't even a person. There's a brain consisting of 100 billion neurons connected by 100 trillion synapses, and that brain hasn't a clue as to what's going on in those 100 trillion synapses. Those things just happen because they obey the laws of physics. All the ways the brain concocts for telling itself what's going on in terms of intentions and decisions and urges and inclinations and preferences and conflicts are so many fictions it's constructed in order to make sense of what it finds itself doing. Agatha, Agatha, which of course Agatha in Greek means good. Um, Agatha is a graduate student. Um, she's studying uh, cognitive science. Agatha, but do you really believe that? Shoket, it's what the science tells me. Agatha, but what you've just said doesn't do justice to all you know. You know so much more than that. Shoket, to Plato. That's the first I've heard her say I know more than I think I know. She's usually arguing with me that I know less. Agatha, well, you know how to be a person. Shoket, what do you mean I know how to be a person? Are you saying I'm a good guy? In which case I accept the compliment and knowing how to be a good guy, I say thank you very much. Agatha, I'm saying you know how to do all the things that a person has to do to be a person. You know how to feel proud of some things you've done and ashamed of others. Change your mind about them, both before and after you've done them. You know how to offer explanations for what you've done and to defend them. And you know how to answer the explanations and defenses that others give for what you've done. You know how to have goals and how to assess them and to put them into actions. And you know how to feel gratified when your goals are met and disappointed and frustrated and resentful when they're not. And you know how to blame others for what was really your fault. You know how to care about yourself in a way that's different from the way you care about anything else because you have a stake in the life that you know how to own as your own. That's some of what I mean by saying that you know how to live a life that's recognizably the life of a person. And if dolphins or elephants or Martians know how to do what you know how to do, then they're persons too. Shoket to Plato. Did you understand what she just said? Plato, yes, I think so. I'm not going to go on, but it's... Uh, Plato wins. <laughs> anyway, thank you, and glad to take your questions. Well, since Plato was very, very interested in the life of Socrates, in the fate of Socrates, um, he actually tells us in the seventh letter, if that's veridical, uh, that he only decided to go into philosophy uh, after Socrates was executed. Uh, because he's so interested in Socrates, he's interested in Alcibiades. And his having Alcibiades make that 
entrance at the end of the symposium. Um, everything that you've just said about the role that the, the destructive role, the horribly destructive role that Alcibiades uh, played in Athenian uh, history, um, and, and you're quite right, I mean Plutarch certainly blames, um, and actually Thucydides blames, uh, more, more to the point, Thucydides blames Alcibiades for uh, the defeat of Athens. Everything that you know uh, about the destructive role that Alcibiades played, the Athenians knew <laughs> only better, right? They had lived through it. So when he has Alcibiades as adorable as he is, and he goes to great lengths to show how adorable he is um, in the symposium, uh, when he has him make that entrance after Socrates has made this uh, speech um, telling us that we have to resist, you know, these beautiful people, uh, these charismatic people, uh, these narcissistic, charismatic, larger than life, godlike people. Um, and he, and Plato knows how hard that is. Socrates couldn't resist Alcibiades. Uh, and probably Plato himself couldn't resist various beautiful creatures. Uh, but in order to make that case that resistance is necessary, what would convince the Athenians better than to bring Alcibiades on stage? This is after Alcibiades, of course, has already died. Um, and uh, see, you know what, yes, you know, this is drama, this is, this is romance, this is irresistible, but here's where it leads. So exactly what, you know, what you were saying, Plato what not only knew, was not on an, only counting on his contemporaries, his readers knowing, but he was utilizing it, he was exploiting it. That's what I think uh, Alcibiades meant to Plato. Well, I, I should probably take other questions, but maybe we can talk afterwards. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, yes, I hang out with two sorts of people. <laughs> Scientists, right? Physicists, cosmologists, um, what do you call them? Cognitive scientists, uh, <laughs> uh, neuroscientists, um, uh, evolutionary biologists. Um, and then, and this on the other side, my family, religious people. <laughs> um, and from both sides, I constantly hear, not from everybody, but it's a, something I hear, variations on this theme, uh, that their particular discipline or area of commitment renders philosophy useless, futile from the scientific side. And, and it's what's interesting about Plato is, of course, Plato, Plato doesn't have the answers. How could he? Philosophy is so dependent on science, on taking what science is telling us and making sense out of that. So Plato can't have the answers. But what he had was, as I say, this incredible nose for philosophical questions. He also has some of the best knockdown arguments for why science, which didn't really even exist, uh, when he was discovering philosophy, but why em empirical methodology cannot answer all of these peculiar questions? Yes, some of them, yes, certainly, uh, but not all of them, and why religion also can't answer some of these peculiar questions. That argument that he gives in the Euthyphro is still repeated by, you know, um, uh, free thinkers everywhere, right? Uh, Spinoza, uh, Bertrand Russell, repeats it and you know our new atheists repeat it um, you know sometimes not giving Plato credit for it uh, as if they discovered it themselves but that is a knockdown argument for why religion can't do the job of grounding morality but let's get back to the science thing yeah I mean I hear this all the quite often you know that um, uh, Particularly the advances in cognitive and uh, effective uh, 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 neuroscience has um, um, 
are answering all of the questions and, and, and giving the evolutionary explanation for how our moral systems have evolved. We've answered the questions of moral philosophy in getting brain neuroimages of what's taking place when we're under the, you know, making decisions. Uh, we've answered the question of free will, uh, uh, qu a quantum field theory, uh, because it doesn't like a vacuum, has answered the question of why is there something rather than nothing. So there is, um, yes, uh, from both sides, I hear it all the time, and that was really the motivation uh, for this for this book to bring Plato back, teach him as much as you know, have him doing his homework at the internet, um, and uh, and seeing what he has to st say still. Um, Leibniz is often credited as, as having first formulated it. Um, like uh, so much that Leibniz um, formulated, it came um, certainly from Spinoza. Spinoza certainly uh, had the question, but guess who beat them to it? Plato in the Timaeus. He is really considering this question um, of why is there something uh, rather than nothing. And his, his idea is that um, uh, no, it's too complicated. <laughs> um, it's, it's something like, uh, and it, it was, it was very inspiring to the new physicists of the 16th and 17th century, the Timaeus. We tend to think of the most important book of Plato as the Republic, but through um, the Middle Ages, when Aristotle was the dominant classical philosopher, the one dialogue that was read was the Timaeus. And um, uh, Kepler and Galileo call Plato the divine Plato, and it's because of that dialogue. And in that dialogue, he, um, his answer to why is there something rather than nothing is that uh, the most beautiful theory, and what beautiful means is mathematically beautiful, and that's still a principle we use in physics, isn't it? Right? We have two theories that are both compatible with all of the data. You go for the more elegant, beautiful, mathematical one. Um, and um, uh, that comes from, from Plato, uh, from the Timaeus. And uh, he thinks, you know, the, the most beautiful theory, uh, most mathematically beautiful theory, um, sort of bursts into existence. Its beauty has to be realized. Uh, beauty is itself a kind of ontological force. Um, and, uh, you know, what do I think of that? I don't know. Uh, but, but it's interesting because he did formulate a very important principle that we've been using in science ever since. You know, uh, if the, you have two theories and one is mathematically more beautiful, more, more elegant, both are empirically adequate, you go with the beautiful one. We, we're still doing that. When, when um, the philosopher of science, Hans Reichenbach, um, asked um, Albert Einstein, uh, how did he feel when, uh, because of the solar eclipse, uh, empirical evidence had finally been brought to uh, validate the general theory of relativity, Einstein said so adorably, oh, well, you know, I, di I didn't need the empirical evidence. I already knew that the theory was true because it's so beautiful. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, and, and that, that intuition comes from, um, comes from Plato. Well, so when one's doing mathematics, is one discovering um, or is one creating, is one inventing, um, or is one doing psychology? Right? Is one learning about the inner, uh, the way our minds work? Um, and um, that's, of course, the fundamental question, not in mathematics, but in the philosophy of mathematics, right? What is it we're doing when we do mathematics? We use mathematics, we use it in physics to describe our world. Uh, but what is, what is the math? that we're using. Is it descriptive? It's not empirically falsifiable. Nothing would negate uh, our mathematical truths. So if it's descriptive, what's it descriptive of? You know, eternity, uh, transcendent, non-spatiotemporal realm. The view that math 
discovers. First of all, once again, Plato's the one who asked the question. Aristotle tells us that in the academy, which was the first European university uh, founded by, by Plato, um, Aristotle tells us they talked about that all the time. Uh, what is it that we're doing when we're doing mathematics? And that Plato would not quite commit himself to this. And in fact, several times in the Republic, when he raises that question, he raises it only to put it on hold, to suspend it. He also seems to think it's a very difficult question. Um, and it is. It's a philosophical question. It's another example of a question that can't be solved scientifically. I mean, we use math, but science doesn't tell us what math is. Good. All. I mean, but but the view that math is descriptive is called Platonism. Whether Plato wanted to commit himself to that or not, um, that is the view that's called Platonism. Gödel, good Gödel, uh, the discoverer, discoverer of the incompleteness theorems, or the inventor of the incompleteness theorems, um, uh, was a passionate Platonist. He believed that uh, mathematics was descriptive. And he wanted to prove this meta-mathematical uh, view, uh, Platonism, mathematically. Um, and he certainly proved something mathematically. Um, but whether it has the philosophical implications that he was sure it had is not so clear. The math is clear. Again, the philosophical interpretation people still argue over. And I change my mind about it all the time. Sometimes I'm convinced uh, that it is a proof of Platonism. Um, recently, I've become convinced it's not. Um, I know I have a book in which I say it is, but I, I have doubts about that. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, uh, another example of a philosophical question that Plato discovered and that's still, you know, very much with us. Yeah, as I often say to my husband, I love philosophy. Philosophers, I'm not so sure about. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, it's an extremely important field. Um, the way it's pursued often leaves me cold. I, in fact, you know, to preserve my love of philosophy, I've had to somewhat distance from the field. Uh, and, you know, but to learn how to think critically, to learn how to think self critically, to take you know, grounding your beliefs seriously. This is the bread and butter that philosophers teach. This is extraordinarily important. Um, you know, sometimes philosophy among philosophers becomes a kind of game of who's the smartest guy in the room. And that's just so inimical to the spirit of, of philosophy. Um, so um, I think that's all I'm going to say before I really get myself into trouble. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, I don't think he had very refined sensibilities about that. I think he would be fine with uh, capital punishment. Um, I said Plato, but that's a really good question. I haven't gotten it yet. I've thought, I've gotten the question, what would Plato think about drugs? But I haven't gotten the question, what would Plato think about capital punishment? And I really would want to. Yes, exactly. For the law, the law would have to um, uh, prevail. Um, if you decide to live in a state and get its benefits, you have to obey its laws. Um, or at least uh, Plato presents Socrates as saying that in the Crito. Um, and it's true. I mean, Socrates was a, um, um, he's like a busker of philosophy. I mean, he was out there in the Agora. He was a great show. He was always putting on a great show. Um, he would <laughs> have a great time here in Harvard Square. Uh, you know, he would, you know, buttonhole everybody, you know, from the most powerful to slaves, as, as he shows us in the Mino, um, and ask them these peculiar questions. Um, and, um, and it's true that he was, uh, as a character, as a well-known Athenian character, he was featured in comic plays of Aristophanes and others. Actually, in the festival in which um, the clouds was shown, uh, the clouds, Aristophanes, the clouds, um, 
where it opens with Plato up in the cloud, I mean not Plato, Socrates up in the clouds, you know, talking balderdash, um, that uh, there was another play, um, the clouds won second place, and the other play which won first place also was making fun of Socrates, right? That That is not extant, we don't have that play. But he was a, you know, a figure of fun. But I think um, a sort of, Lovingly, um, it was. I have a whole theory about it, which is complicated. Um, I'm supposed to say at that point, at this point, by the book, but it's um, uh, that um, the Athenians, like us, were very concerned uh, with the question of what it is that makes us matter. Uh, what is it that uh, makes this very brief? life that were given matter. And um, they believe that you had to do something extraordinary. But most people are ordinary. Uh, and uh, t in order to sort of spread the extraordinary around, there was this ideology of Athenian exceptionalism, uh, really, that to be an Athenian citizen was already to be extraordinary. and. Socrates went around puncturing that presumption that you've taken care of this question of what is it to live a life worth living uh, just by being um, a Greek, you know, the greatest people uh, in the world, and then an Athenian, the greatest among the Greeks. He tells us this, you know, Plato again and again, that Aristotle was puncturing this um, presumption. And the Athenians could take it all in good stride when they were riding high, when they had an empire, um, when they were the great Athenian empire. Uh, when was Socrates put on trial? Right after the defeat of Athens, when Athens was defeated by that inferior Greek state, Sparta, with its inferior culture. Um, that's when they couldn't tolerate uh, Socrates anymore. That's when they decided that Socrates must die. Uh, they couldn't let him go around. They were struggling uh, to regain their notion of exceptionalism. They couldn't have somebody going around uh, telling them that they don't know the first thing about living a worthwhile life. Uh, just being an Athenian is not doing it for you. So I think that really far more than the plays of Aristophanes and others were, were responsible for, um, for Socrates' death in uh, 399 BC. And after all, they, they were defeated in 404 uh, BC, 399. Uh, that's when they put him on trial. Yes, others as well. Um, here's what I think the role of a philosopher is supposed to be. Um, to maximize coherence, uh, internal coherence, um, in all sorts of ways. To maximize our ethical coherence, uh, and many of us have, well, I mean, we have ethical commitments. A three-year-old child has a notion of fairness, you know, just try to give her sister something more than she has, and, you know, she's shrieking bloody murder that it's not fair. So we, you know, we have these notions of ethics, um, but um, uh, we hold, we have other beliefs uh, that are not um, consistent with those ethical beliefs. So that's one sphere, one very important sphere of philosophical activity, and one where we can actually see progress. When I have Plato being surprised again and again, it's often over our expanding notion of human rights. Uh, the Greeks didn't really have, that came as a great shock to me, it's really not the notion of individual rights um, among these great ethical thinkers, Plato and Aristotle, that really emerges in the Enlightenment, that notion of, of individual rights. I uh, might even have something to do with the influence of religion, um, that religion owned those questions for all that time, and that presumption that only the extraordinary among us are living lives worth, worth living. I mean, that, that um, proposition, I have to say, that the uh, the unexamined life is not worth living, which um, many people regard with kind of piety is, when you look at it, it's egregious. There's so many things that one sort of looks at 
has been regarded piously is actually abominable. What do you mean the unexamined life is not worth living? Um, all lives um, are, are worth living. Um, and we owe it to all lives to give the resources so that their life can flourish. So that's a, you know, but so that got rooted out later in the, in the 17th century. But this, the kind of progress I see as really pretty, um, uh, salient that, that philosophy has made is ethical. Um, but making science coherent. Science can't make itself coherent. Science uh, has all sorts of presumptions about uh, the methodology that it, it uses and why it works. Um, and it itself can't empirically uh, use those. It has to presume them. That's the job of philosophy. And one other area is the results that science delivers to us, um, like what we're getting from neuroimaging. Um, how do we reconcile that with other beliefs or commitments we have without which it's very hard to live a coherent life? Like that I am pursuing my life, even if I can't find, you know, with this life, right? This life that for which I plan and, and acts that I own and that I um, feel responsible for offering some kind of explanation. Um, how do I reconcile that with what, you know, the scientific image of, of the person? This is a, an idea really that comes from the 20th century philosopher Wilfred Sellers, and he saw the great role of philosophy as mediating between the scientific image and what he called the manifest image. Um, and that, that too, so it's, it's, it's dependent on our scientific knowledge, but it's, it's, um, reconciling it and in general in all of these three areas ethics trying to make science itself coherent and making uh, the results of science coherent uh, with our other beliefs uh, philosophy is in the job of maximizing our coherence making us live as coherent lives as as we can